Hello everyone, this is Professor Derek A. Smith with How to Pass the CISSP Certification Exam. It's the night before the exam. You've known about this date for weeks now. The date had been marked on a calendar, money had been spent, and here you are down to the last few hours before it's time to take the test. Where did all the time go? If only you can go back and study more, read more, and prepare more. Unfortunately, this is the most common thought that people have right before they take their cybersecurity exam. Then there's the worst case scenario. You grit your teeth through several hours in the exam room only to walk out with a failing score just a few points shy of passing the actual test. This is truly a gut-wrenching feeling. Today's certifications can open doors to good careers in the ever-changing and demanding cybersecurity field. For some jobs, it is a mandatory requirement to possess these certifications before even being considered for a position. These days, it's imperative for you to take certifications seriously, no matter which side that you fall on in the debate between certifications or getting a degree. The purpose of this video is to give you some methods and tips that's going to give you the edge you need to pass your security exam. There's a lot of books available and websites that's going to provide you with a lot of different packages that will help you towards your goal of acquiring your certifications. Many of these focus only on the content. I actually have a course that teaches the content as well. What makes these tips and methods different is that I help you filter the content, label the content, and utilize this approach to slice through possible answers. This video is not intended for those who've just begun studying and during their time in the industry to gain the experience and knowledge required to adequately pass the exam. This particular video is for the professional who's put in the time for study and knowledge and simply needs that edge for passing their exam. So in this video, I'm gonna cover five methods to break down questions and validate possible answers. Some methods work better than other methods and some can be combined to increase confidence in your answer selections. The methods are, number one, the language method, number two, positive negative, number three, put in order, number four, broad brushstroke, and number five, the CIA method. Let's begin. Language is how we communicate. Questions on exams are trying to communicate problems and scenarios to the test taker. Language is how we take keywords and apply our knowledge of the keywords towards evaluating the possible answer choices to make a selection. Let's look at a couple examples to see how to do this. Example one, a member of the executive team raises his concerns to you that his company's phone Bluetooth may have been compromised even though the discovery mode was set to off. Which of the following attacks will be the most likely culprit? A is bluejacking, B is red fang, C is blue snarfing, and D is blue spoofing. So in example number one, the keyword is Bluetooth. An attack is something that is bad. So bad, we have red up there for answer B. And the fang is an aggressive variation of tooth. So we have red fang. This correlates to answer B. Let's explore this just a little bit further. In example two, we ask, what is a spear phishing attack? We have A, a targeted attempt at specific individuals to gain information. B, attempts to gain information by masquerading as a trustworthy contact. C, direct links and email requesting users to link to, a, to visit a site. And D, attackers call potential victims to apply information over the phone. Now, take a look at this example. In this example, the keyword is spear. When you're hunting with a spear, you have a specific target that you want to attack. So although all these choices are variations of phishing, the only one by language that answers this question is question A, a targeted attempt at a specific individual to gain information. The next testing technique is positive negative. There are some questions that will ask for the answer that least or best answers the question. In these questions, you should think of the choices in terms of how positive or how negative the choices are. Let me give you a couple examples to help you understand this concept. Example one asks, which of the following practices would prevent a negative impact to the company due to the loss of key IT personnel? A is job rotation. B is have one person train on all tasks. C is assume IT staff is sharing their knowledge. And D is increase salaries. So in this example, the question is seeking a positive choice for the answer, okay? 
They say it's going to have a negative impact. We want to prevent that. So we're looking for a positive impact. So B and C are both negative. So we can get rid of those. Look at B. Have one person train all tasks. That's not a good thing for your organization. B creates a single point of failure. C is making an assumption that personnel are sharing a knowledge. They may not be sharing that knowledge. A and D are both positive, but D is also making an assumption that the loss of key personnel is due to financial comp compensation. It's saying increased salaries. That means people don't make enough money. Assumptions can almost always be thrown out. The remaining positive answer is, of course, answer A. Let's look at example two. Which of the following warrants a security investigation? A, employee always comes to work late and stays late. B, poor work performance. C, uses company resources for personal use. And D, employee cleared log files on company computer. In this example, the question is seeking a negative choice. Remember the last question was a positive choice we're looking for. This time we're looking for a negative choice. A, B, C, and D are all negative choices. So how do we distinguish? Let me tell you. In this example, we are measuring the degrees of how negative each choice is. B can be quickly eliminated as performance is a management issue, not a security issue. So get rid of poor work performance. A and C would be an issue if security policies and program dictated as a violation. Some work offices allow these practices. And A, employee always comes to work late and stay late might be allowed in the company. And C, uses company resources for personal use, at my job we can do that to a certain extent. So from a security perspective, a user that has rights to clear their log files is clearly trying to hide something. That hiding is a case for an investigation. So the most negative answer is answer D. Let's look at the next technique, and that's putting in order. Some questions will ask you to put a process in order. It will ask for what comes either before or after a step. This, of course, requires some knowledge of the process. So let's break down two scenarios to learn this. In example one, XYZ company has recently suffered a data breach. The incident handling team cannot determine if all artifacts from the attack have been removed. And due to time constraints by management, the system must be put back into operation immediately. Which of the following steps should begin next? So we have A, containment, B, eradication, C, lessons learned, and D, recovery. So assuming all possible answers are part of the process, you can deduce what the order is. Remember, I said you have to study and have to learn the material so you can understand and know what order it would be. Let's take a look at this. With this one, I would say number one is A, you want to contain the problem first. Number two is B, you want to eradicate that problem. Number three would be D, you need to recover from the loss or from the problem itself. And then number four would be C, you want to have your lessons learned. The question is seeking what comes after eradication, and the key word for that was removed. So in this case, the answer would be D. In example number two, as a senior security manager of XYZ company, you are conducting a business impact analysis on critical business functions. What is the first step in conducting your business impact analysis? A is evaluate emergency evacuation plans, B is gather information. C is perform risk assessment, and D is test business continuity plans. Again, you have to know what this is before you can answer the question. Now, assuming all possible answers are not all related, the best you can order the choices is, one is B, first you gather some information. Two is that you perform risk assessment, which is C. A and D fall under C if using the broad brushstroke method, which we're gonna talk about in just a minute. The question is seeking what the first step is. Therefore, the answer would be B. You want to gather information first. So I mentioned the broad brushstroke method. Let's cover that next. Have you faced a situation on your exams when you're torn between two or more choices for a question? No matter how many times you review the answers, you can see it from each answer's point of view. You may have marked this question for review and came back to it later, hoping that later in your exam, you've magically resolved the answer in your head to find out you're still nowhere closer to a selection. Even if you get the dreaded 50-50, you know, you've narrowed it down to two and now you just want to flip a coin. What is it about the phrase, choose the best answer that seems to destroy many knowledgeable professionals sitting in these exams? We all work in an industry that propels us to be exact, precise, and write most, if not all the time. Yet, it is that very mindset that test question writers are going after. What if I told you the best answer may be the one 
that can encompass the other choice you are torn about. Let's take a look at this so you can understand it better. Example one, XYZ company has experienced an increase in network attacks in the past few weeks. Management has concerns over denial of service attacks, limiting bandwidth. No sensitive data is at risk. Which of the following security measures below best addresses management's concerns? A. Employing adequate perimeter defense mechanisms. B. Keeping antivirus signatures up to date. C. Acquiring additional circuits to route company traffic on. Or D. Ensuring firewalls, IDSs, and IPSs are all working properly. Choice B is easy to throw out as this addresses an integrity issue only. I'm going to talk about that more in the next section. Although C will possibly add a redundant line in case one fails, it may only increase the attack surface. Now we have more places that the bad guy can get to. That would not be good. A and D are what is left leaving the dreaded 50-50 scenario that I spoke about. Both choices are right, but one makes an assumption that every company has all three of these mechanisms that I talk about. Even without throwing out the assumption, the question to ask yourself is, can D the more specific and detailed answer fit inside A. The best answer is the one that addresses the problem best. In most cases, it is the answer that can contain many possible answers. So if we look at answers A and D, we see that D is assuming that they have firewalls, IDSs, and IPSs. But in A, employing adequate perimeter defense mechanisms can be any mechanism that you might have. The last concept we have is CIA or the CIA method or confidentiality, integrity, and availability method. If you are working in cybersecurity, it's a given you have heard of the CIA triad. These three security principles are the bedrock which most security programs rely on. As you study for your exam, label the technologies, the concepts, and the practices to build a mental database of the labels. So when you read the questions, you're going to be able to identify the problem and then label it. After that, you label the possible answers. You're going to be surprised to find in many cases this method alone is going to help you pass the exam very easily. Let's take a look at some examples. XYZ company management wants to deploy a standard baseline across the network for all workstations. Their goals for the baseline are to improve patch management, software licensing, and prohibit malware from being loaded on systems. Management has tasked you to review the following similarly priced technology proposals and to recommend only one of them. Which of the following solution best supports their goals? A is full disk encryption, B is whitelisting software, C is firewall upgrade, and D is virtualized server environment. The goal of baselines is integrity. A and C are for confidentiality. D is for availability, which leaves us with only B as the sole integrity answer to choose as the last answer standing. Now, isn't this a great process? Easy to eliminate and find the right answer. So the answer is, is B, to whitelist your software. Let's take a look at another example. Which of the choices below could lower the impact of the theft of computer assets in an organization with sensitive and personally identifiable information? A is intrusion prevention system, B is strong password policy, C is full disk encryption, and D is data synchronization. Let's look at the problem. The problem in this question is a confidentiality issue. Talking about people's PII and keeping that safe. With more than one choice being labeled in line with the question means this gets a bit tricky for you. But keep in mind the key word is information, and information equals data. Data resides on the system. The concern was originally theft, which means the system being removed from the network. Therefore, A can be eliminated. Technically, B is not incorrect, but even strong passwords can be broken. So that leaves you with the only thing that's going to really secure you, and that answer is C, full disk encryption. All right, folks, if you go with those five processes that I spoke about, you do very well on this exam. Here are some general tips I want to leave you with. You need to read the question again after you choose your answer to ensure that it makes sense. Combine these five methods I just taught you to increase confidence in your answers. Use active learning techniques such as memory palace or active reading. Active reading is simply standing up to read or walk around as you read a difficult subject. I want to wish you luck on your exam, and I have one more thing that I want to talk to you about. You also need to learn the content for the exam before you can apply these principles that I just taught you. I have an online live instructional program that lasts six weeks. It's conducted by myself. 
I give you 4,000 practice study questions, even though it says 1,200 here. I've increased it to a 4,000 question disc that I actually send you in the mail. I help you put together a personal study plan. You can repeat my course as often as you like for free. Also, all training is recorded, so you can watch as many times if you, as you like. And the biggest thing is that you get a free trip to one of 16 great locations once you sign up for the course. Again, join my six-week CISSP training course, and not only will you prepare for the exam, but you'll get a five- or three-day vacation to one of 16 locations that I have now for you to choose from. All right, folks, that's going to be it. Hopefully, get ready for your exam using these great tips that I gave you and join me in my six-week program to help you learn all the objectives and all the material you need to pass the exam. This is Professor Derek A. Smith, and I will see you on the next video.